everybody. It's Dr. Alex Earl and it's hump day with Dr. Alex Earl. Uh, we're here at Pure Plastic Surgery uh, and this is the time that I get to spend with you guys and go over some plastic surgery topics and of course answer all the questions that you may have. Um, so we've gotten into some pretty interesting topics. So we went uh, kind of the last couple of weeks, uh, about two weeks ago, I believe we're talking about patient safety. Uh, last week we talked about patient selection, uh, two excellent, excellent topics. Um, and uh, you should, if you, if you miss those lives, then you can always go to either the IGTV at Pure Plastic Surgery, um, or you can go to my YouTube channel uh, and you can catch those there as well. So I highly, highly encourage you guys to go and check that out. Uh, we have many, many topics up there. You can probably answer pretty much any question you may have uh, if you watch those, um, since they're pretty, pretty comprehensive, okay? But today, uh, today is, I thought we would talk about what I believe is probably uh, just as important as the surgery itself. Uh, I, was, I would say, uh, maybe, I don't know, I'm not gonna say it's more important though, maybe in some, some factions it is, but this is definitely just as important as the surgery itself, and that is your post-op care, okay? However, from my point of view, it's one of the things that's pretty much out of my control. So, you know, of course we make recommendations and then we expect the patients to follow them, uh, but sometimes, you know, you just have to make sure that you understand like how important this is uh, in order to have a successful outcome, okay? So, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about kind of the post-op care, some of the most common procedures that we do here at Pure. Uh, so, of course, you know, LiPo 360, BBL, uh, you know, pretty much any breast case that we do, uh, whether it's a breast dog, um, breast reduction, mastopexy, mastopexy with lift, etc. Uh, I'm sorry, mastopexy with implant uh, or not. And then, uh, of course, the tummy tuck. Um, so, I was gonna, I'm kind of gonna go into kind of the, the general uh, recommendations that we uh, provide to our patients after these procedures uh, and then of course I'll be happy to answer any more specific questions you guys may have. Um, so I'm just going to start with LiPo 360, okay? So LiPo 360 and, and also of course BBL which includes a LiPo 360 um, is one of those surgeries where the post-op care is extremely, extremely important. Um, you can have a beautiful, beautiful result on the table and it can get pretty much completely ruined by inadequate post-op care. Uh, let me just put it that way, okay? Um, so uh, let's, let's get into it. So in general, actually, for all of these procedures, um, the overall kind of recovery, I, I would say six weeks. Six weeks is a good number to remember kind of at the back of your mind or your head um, because for all of these procedures, there's gonna be no heavy lifting, okay? No strenuous activity. All right, and also no submerging the body underwater uh, during that time, okay? So no bathtub, pool, jacuzzi, ocean, nothing like that, okay, for six weeks, only shower, all right? So that's kind of in general for all procedures. Uh, so that, that is from each and every one of these, okay? All right, for liposuction, let's get a little bit more specific. So for liposuction 360, I tend to put a drain in as well. So there is some drain care. Uh, the drain is only one drain. It usually only stays in for about four days or so, and we typically get it out here in the clinic before patients head back home, okay? Um, and then, of course, one of the most important things that has with the lipo is compression, okay? So the use of the faja-type garment is extremely important, okay? Uh, and there's you know, different types of fajas and, and different kind of stages to the faja. So initially, we're gonna be putting you in what we call stage one faja, Okay, that one has is a little bit more kind of more distensible, more elastic. Okay, uh, because like I said many times before, you don't want to put too much compression too early because that can be detrimental. Okay, that's why you have that stage one faja, which kind of is a little bit more stretchy, uh, and you're gonna wear that stage one faja with foams and boards inside until the swelling starts to come down and certain things start to feel a bit loose. Once things are a bit too loose, even with the foams and the boards inside, then you can switch to your stage two faja. It varies from patient to patient as to the timing, but uh, that is typically, the average is somewhere around the two week mark, okay? Now the Faja, you're gonna wear that basically 23 hours a day, okay? Night and day for the first six weeks, okay? Uh, you take it off as a shower, wash it, or if you need a short break, like an hour or so, that's okay, but otherwise you keep it on. After six weeks, then you can scale down on that Faja to 12 hours a day, and you're gonna do that till at least the three to four month mark. 
okay? Um, after three to four months, then you can decide what you want to do. Some patients like to continue to wear a paha, some are kind of sick of it at that point in time, just want to burn the thing. Uh, but you have a little bit more leeway, leeway excuse me, after the three to four month mark, okay? Um, now, the fit for the paha is very, very important, okay? So I know there's, you know, there's, a lot, there's some custom pahas out there, um, and uh, I've heard of like Tributo, I think a lot of patients are happy with that. Uh, but here's the thing with the paha. It has to give you adequate compression, especially kind of along the waist area, but it, it should not, okay, it should not give you uh, a lot of tightness or compression along the hips and buttock area, okay? That's a key, one key thing for the paha. So many times you have to think of it a little bit backwards. You have to find a paha that's not giving you a lot of compression to the hips and the buttock, and then if you needed to have it taken in at the waist, then you can have a seamstress do that for you, okay? But then the most important part is to not put that pressure there because we want those fat cells to live, right? Um, okay, um, so that's that's the, one of the most important things with, with the paha there, okay? All right, um, of course, with the LiPo360, the other thing that's extremely important is the uh, massage, okay? So we do recommend the minimum of 10, though that strictly is the minimum. Uh, sometimes 15 or 20 is not unusual, okay? And you have to go to a well-qualified, okay, experienced post light bulb lymphatic massage therapist, okay? Um, we really want, we want you to go to someone who's, who has experience with this, who knows what they're doing, uh, who's able to identify any potential issues such as fibrosis. They can identify it early and then employ different modal modalities to try to prevent that, okay? What are other modalities that they can do other than just a lymphatic massage? You know, there's things such as cavitation, carboxy therapy, there's also wood therapy, uh, and, uh, and you know, things of that nature. Also ultrasound, excuse me, that's the one I was thinking of. So ultrasound treatment as well. All right, so someone who, who has a lot of experience is able to identify things such as fibrosis early, uh, and then they could, they could, you know, do the appropriate treatment and prevent that from, uh, from happening or from getting worse, okay? So massage is extremely important. Uh, we talked about the drain care, and again, uh, you know, six weeks, after six weeks, that's when things begin to change for LiPo 360, that's when you become more active. You can head back to the gym, uh, you can work out, you can do swimming, uh, and everything, and things of that nature. Now, the one of the, so, and for BBL, Everything that I just mentioned um, is pretty much the same, except there's some added things that you have to be careful with in the post-up care. One of them I kind of mentioned, which is not putting pressure on the buttock or hips, right? So um, you're, for most patients, for the most part, they're uh, face down when they're laying, so they're laying face down. If they're gonna sit, you're gonna use the BBL or booty pillow to put the pressure on the thighs and offload the pressure of the, uh, the buttock and hips. Again, I said, like I mentioned, the faja, you don't want it to be too tight around the buttock and hip area. Uh, so you want to do all these precautions to try to minimize that pressure uh, to try to get as many of those fat cells to live, okay? Now, a question that we get very, very often is, uh, you know, why do, say, surgeons in other countries such as Colombia or Dominican Republic, um, they say you can sit pretty much right away? Uh, well, you know, of course, all surgeons have their preferences, but uh, what I believe is happening is that, you know, if you are putting fat, say, into the, a deeper layer, such as the muscle, which of course we don't do here because it's a potentially very, very dangerous, but if you are putting fat into the deeper layers, then, you know, whether you sit or not sit, you know, that's a, that's a layer that is super, is very well vascularized. Uh, the fat take is actually is better uh, in the muscle. Um, and so then, you know, caring about sitting or putting pressure probably is not as important. Okay, but of course we don't do that here. It is, you know, it is potentially dangerous uh, if you're going that deep because you could potentially hit these vessels uh, that can then lead to a fat embolus. So, uh, so since we are using that compartment that's between the muscle and the skin, um, we then, you know, have to make sure that there's not an undue pressure to that area to try to get as many of those fat cells to live, okay? So uh, I do believe that it's very, very important. Try to not put any pressure to the buttock of hips, especially in the first weeks in uh, the first six weeks, excuse me. Uh, after six weeks, then you can start sitting. You can start, you know, kind of sleeping whichever position you want to sleep in uh, and everything's okay. The other thing that's different for a BBL uh, as opposed to LiPo 360 alone is feeding the fat. So, feeding the fat, I do believe in. I think it's very, very important. You certainly don't want to lose any weight uh, in the first three months or so. You definitely want to maintain your calorie count. Um, and you want to eat foods that are healthy in what we call 
healthy fats. Um, so avocado is one, salmon is another, certain nuts as well, uh, meat uh, products, and also uh, milk products. So, so ice cream uh, and milkshake is actually good. So enjoy, enjoy that ice cream in the first six weeks to three months, okay? Um, but really the thing, you know, the most important thing is you want to at, least, at the very least maintain your weight during that time. Certainly not lose weight. If you gain a couple pounds, actually that's okay. Maybe you gain, I don't know, up to five pounds and that's okay. You don't want to go crazy. Uh, but if you gain a little weight, that's okay too uh, during that time. Okay. Um, all right. So those are, that's pretty much like 360 and DVL. Uh, and so next then we, uh, we can talk a little bit about the breast. Um, so for breast, again, you know, it's the same thing with the six weeks, no heavy lifting, no strength activity, no submerging the breast or incisions in the water. Okay, but what are the kind of the different things, the added things for the breast? Um, well, actually, range of motion with the upper extremity is okay. So you can slowly uh, move your arms in any direction. You just don't want to do anything like heavy or jerky with the upper extremities, okay? The other thing is you're going to be wearing a bra, okay? So initially it's going to be that surgical bra that we give you for the first week. Um, and then you can wear any soft cuff bra as long as it doesn't have underwires, okay? No underwire bras for the first six weeks, okay? Um, after six weeks, then it's okay. You can use the underwire bra. You can also, you know, start going back to the gym. You can do swimming and everything else after the six week mark, okay? However, that doesn't mean that you're done with the settling process if you had an implant, okay? So, an implant requires about three months to settle. So it's gonna take at least three months to settle. Uh, for most patients, you know, we just kind of allow the implant to settle on its own. There are, you know, some particular circumstances where we think maybe one side is moving a little slower than the other, uh, or we think, you know, we just wanna move things along and then we can employ some massage techniques and sometimes a band as well. I don't do that kind of routinely for all patients, uh, but I do kind of take it on a case-by-case -case basis. So if for whatever reason I feel like an implant is not progressing um, you know, the way that I want, or as quickly as they want, then I may have the patient start doing massage or wearing a band, okay? Um, so those are kind of the most important things with your breast surgery, uh, and, in addition to just your regular kind of six weeks uh, of taking it easy. Can you okay? quickly just explain with each procedure you have listed, how many massages you recommend? At oh yeah, so that's a great question, thank you. So, okay, so for LiPo 360 and, and BBL, it, it, it's gonna be very similar. Again, we recommend a minimum of 10, uh, but that strictly is the minimum. Sometimes 15 or even 20 is not unusual. And really for these two procedures, that's where massage is the most important, okay? These are where it really, really, uh, you know, it really, really comes in and, and having an experienced massage therapist uh, really make, can make a world of difference, okay? Uh, another thing that you can do is also, on top of your kind of professional massages, um, you can do some self massage and what we do recommend is kind of a, with a roller, uh, kind of roller massage therapy. You can get one of these um, out of I'm at Amazon actually. And uh, if you're ever curious as to what exactly I'm talking about, you know, you can always shoot us a message and we can tell you which one um, we do recommend. Okay, but massage by professional and self massage with, with a roller is extremely important and the minimum is 10. But honestly, you know, something, you know, if you really want to get the best results, you'll probably end up doing more than that. Um, for breast, um, like I said, I don't, I don't necessarily recommend uh, massage unless I really feel it's needed. Okay, so if I, like I said, if I see that the implant's not moving along just quite like I wanted to, then I'll recommend some breast massage, and we'll go over those techniques uh, with the patient at that time. Okay, now with the tummy tuck uh, massage is, um, it's a, it's a little bit different. Okay, it's not the same as the lipo in the BBL. Okay, it's not as kind of a strict, you know, like if for whatever reason you can't get, get a massage in the first couple of weeks, that's okay. Uh, but the massage initially with the tummy tuck, the ones that you get in kind of the first few days while you're here in Miami, are going to be focused mostly on the areas that we did like, which is the flanks and the waist. Uh, and you're also going to get some massage to the lower back. Now you may be thinking, that's kind of strange, um, Dr. Earl, you didn't do anything to the lower back. And that's right, but the fact is that after you have a tummy tuck, because everything is so tight, because we pulled that skin tight, because we did that muscle repair on the inside, you're gonna be uh, sleeping, you know, with a couple of pillows behind your back, a pillow behind your knees, or in a recliner, so you're kind of sleeping like this, and you're also, you're walking like this, a little hunched over like this. So when you do that, you start developing a little bit of, you know, strain to the lower back, and you can develop some, sometimes some spasms or just lower back pain. And so massage to that area is very, very helpful, especially in that first week or so. 
After two weeks, we have to be given some initial healing time to the belly button and the, and the lower transverse incision. Then you can start doing massage to the kind of the front of the abdomen uh, at that time. And like I said, it's not as strict as leg one BBL. Uh, you know, typically if you do, you, you know, between five to ten massages, that's sufficient. Um, and you know, it, and like I said, starting for the front, you want to start at two weeks out. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so tummy, since we are talking about tummy tuck, so so what it does become more important with tummy tuck is the drains. Okay, so you typically have two drains. We do teach you how to take care of them, um, and they're in anywhere between one to three weeks. Okay, for most patients, we can get one of the drains out while they're here, but it's very very common that you may have to go home with the drain. Okay, and if you go, so for anyone that's coming over to have a tummy tuck. Um, we want you guys to already plan for coming home with the drain and having someone identify that's going to be able to remove that drain for you. And that does not mean, listen, does not mean in the ER or urgent care. Okay, do not, do not, that's not a good plan. Okay, for the most part when you go to the ER or urgent care, what they'll do is they'll, they won't, you know, they, they'll refuse to remove the drain, they won't treat you well, and then they'll charge you, the, you know, a ridiculous amount of money for doing nothing. So I do not recommend to go to the ER or urgent care for drain removal. Okay, you have to either talk to your PCP or if you have, you know, someone that you know with nursing or just basically someone who's actually, you know, competent and willing to do it, uh, we can walk them through it. And some patients even have removed their own drain, uh, which is fine too. Uh, we do have a video up, uh, you know, kind of explain the steps. It's a very, very simple, very straightforward process. Uh, so, pay, you know, you guys can look at that video uh, and potentially do it yourself as well. Uh, but you just have to have a plan for that. So that's, you know, as part of your overall plan, just have a plan as to what you're going to do with, with your drain when you get home, you know, who's going to remove it, and the plan is not going to the ER or urgent care, okay? And what happens to the incision when the, the drain is removed? Yeah, so there's really nothing you have to do there. So <clears throat> once you remove the drain, there will be a little hole opening there. You just have to put a little antibiotic ointment on there for the first 48 hours, and then it'll just seal on its own. And that's it, nothing else that needs to be done. Okay. And can you remove the drain yourself? Yeah, so you can. It's a very, very simple three-step process. Um, so step one is opening up the little bowl. Um, step two is cutting the little stitch. Uh, we typically use a nylon stitch, a little black stitch that uh, is basically attaching the drain to the skin. And then step three is just a gentle pull and boom, the drain comes right out. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but of course a little tougher to understand just by listening to me. So you do want, you know, we do have that video available. That's going to make things a lot, uh, you know, easier to understand. Okay, all right. So and then so with a tummy tuck, like I said, you really, really, really have to focus on not doing any straining. Okay, uh, especially in the first six weeks. Remember, we did we do that muscle repair, and so you want to avoid heavy lifting. You want to avoid strenuous activity. You want to try to avoid, and I know it's tough, but you want to try to avoid sneezing and coughing. Uh, and you want to try to avoid constipation. So these are things that, that patients may not think about, you know, but you want to avoid anything that's going to increase your intra-abdominal pressure that may cause, you know, those, those stitches that we did the repair on to, to kind of to bust or, or break, okay? So, uh, so you want to avoid sneezing, coughing, constipation, heavy lifting or strenuous activity. Very, very important for the first six weeks. How would one avoid constipation? Because we know after surgery, the pain meds can leave you constipated. Right. So, so you know, the Percocets and other pain medications, other narcotic type medications can cause constipation. So um, you have to, uh, again, think about that ahead of time and take stool softeners as, as needed. So you can take, you know, Colace uh, or Docalax. Uh, both of those tend to work uh, fairly well. Of course, you want to stay, you know, you want to make sure you stay hydrated uh, because dehydration will only make the problem worse. So you want to drink your one to two gallons of fluid a day. Uh, and then of course, you know, things like prune juice may also be helpful. And if you get to the point where you're really having trouble, you know, even, you know, a laxative or an enema may be necessary, okay? But we really want to try to avoid getting to that point. And then of course, the other thing is trying to get off your pain meds as soon as possible. So as soon as you can get off your pain meds, the better. That's why we highly recommend the Expiral shot, um, because with the Expiral, there's typically less need for pain meds uh, in the short term and in the longer term. So patients take less narcotics, there's less constipation, they're able to switch to um, non-steroidal such as ibuprofen quicker 
uh, and overall they have a, a little bit of an easier recovery for that. So do highly recommend the x shot for all tummy tuck patients. Okay? And following a tummy tuck, when is it okay to start lightly working out? Six weeks. Okay, so before that, only walking. Actually, that's, that's one thing I didn't mention, I should have mentioned at the beginning of the talk because walking is extremely important for all procedures. Any procedure that we do under general anesthesia, you want to be able to walk and you want to wear your compression socks, okay? Why is that? Because we want to prevent what's called DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, potential clots that can start in the area of the calf and sometimes this lodge shoot up into the lung and, call what's called, and, and cause what's called a pulmonary embolus okay uh, which can lead to serious serious problems so with any of these procedures you want to be up and walking about 10 minutes every hour while awake from day one okay it's super super important thank you would prp injections post-op help recover recovery time on the wounds of a tummy tuck uh, i've never really heard of that um you know theoretically in theory could it help perhaps uh but i never really really kind of in, in the you know surgical that's surgical literature i never read about uh, using PRP for tummy tuck incisions. And really quick, I know you touched on it a little bit, but how many garments should you wear post tummy tuck and how long should you wear them? Okay, great. So at the, yes, uh, the beginning, uh, after the tummy tuck, you're gonna have an abdominal binder. So it's just kind of a white wrap, okay, goes around you. Sometimes we do, we do put foams underneath there so that the binder kind of doesn't dig into your skin, okay? And once both drains come out, then you can switch from that binder to a faja type garment, okay? And you're gonna wear that faja type garment for at least uh, at least three months. But honestly, a tummy tuck is one of those procedures where it takes a long time for that swelling to come down, especially in that lower abdominal kind of uh, super pubic area. That's kind of the most dependent area of the trunk. So it takes a long time for that to for that swelling to go away. And by a long time, I can I can it can be easily be six months, eight months, even up to a year. Uh, so if you need the additional compression, that's fine. You know, it, some people take longer than others. That's not a problem. Uh, everyone is at their own pace, and you just keep uh, continue to wear that compression as needed. How do you know if you're over compressing? Um, well, yeah. So you you don't want you know things that are so tight that they feel like they're either digging into your skin or that you can't breathe. Uh, and and you, you definitely want to be careful with, with over compressing early with essentially all these procedures. So with LiPo and BBL, you want to be careful because that's going to reduce some of the blood supply to the skin that was just had surgical trauma from the procedure itself. And that can lead to problems like uh, what we call LiPo burns or Faja burns. Um, and then also to uh, potential, you know, scarring down and fibrosis. Okay. With the tummy tuck, same deal. You put, if you put on that binder, you know, too, too tight, like just kill it. Uh, you're, you may then devascularize some of that skin again that we kind of cut and undermine just then pull down and that can lead to you know what we call skin necrosis uh, and possible wounds and uh, issues like that so you want to be very careful with that so it is a happy medium it's kind of like you, you got to kind of go the you know the goldilocks way can't be too loose can't be too tight either way there can be problems okay and if you currently have a scar from c-section would you cut the same place for a tummy tuck or could you hide that yeah typically we cut kind of just below the c-section scar so so the patient ends up with just one scar. You're not end up. You don't have like two scars uh, in that area. Uh, but it is, of course, we have to extend it for the tummy tuck. So it's going to go from hip to hip. So it's at the level of your C-section scar. We remove that C-section scar, but you're going to have your your kind of your longer tummy tuck scar in that area. Okay. Is the the working out staying active for lipo 360? Is that the same as when you do just lipo definition, the high definition lipo suction? So the yeah, so the, so the recovery for all, for you know whether we do high depth lipo ab etching or just kind of your regular lipo sculpture is all very very similar, okay. Um, but what I, what what I would say the main difference with high depth lipo is is that uh, you really really you know once you pass that six week mark you really really want to stay in shape like you want to you know you want to head back to the gym you want to get back on your diet uh, and really you really stay in shape to really make that you know really look good. Um, if you have high depth lipo and for whatever reason you gain 20 pounds, you know, things are not going to look very good. So it's basically, it's really a, a commitment. Okay. You have to commit, um, to, you know, to that exercise program you have to commit to that diet. And then if you do that, I mean, you're going to look fantastic. Uh, because like I said before, the, you know, surgery is not a substitute for, you know, exercise and diet. It's, it's actually, it's synergistic. Once you, when you put everything together, when you do surgery, 
and your diet and your exercise program, that's when I've seen like the best results, like really truly fantastic results because that person like really dedicated themselves to you know achieving that you know optimal result. Um, and so for high def light bulb, that's something that you really have to commit to. Um, and then that way, then you'll really get that nice definition. You really get those abs to pop out, those obliques to pop out, and you'll get that very, very athletic look. Can you just explain the difference between a small tummy tuck, a regular tummy tuck, and an extended tummy tuck? Yeah, so there's there's mini tummy tuck, there's your rest, basically your, your full or regular tummy tuck, and your extended tummy tuck. So mini tummy tuck is when you're just removing a little bit of excess skin below the belly button. You're typically not moving the belly button and you're typically not doing a muscle repair application, okay? So that's when you have that little extra pooch just below the belly button. And the incision is longer than a C-section, but not all the way all the way out to kind of hip to hip. Um, your regular tummy tuck is what we do for most patients, okay? Uh, that's when we undermine the skin all the way up here to the cycloid process. Uh, we do, you know, have to release the belly button. We do the muscle repair uh, and we go essentially from hip to hip. Uh, and then the extended tummy tuck is everything that I just said with the full tummy tuck, except we got to extend that incision around the corner. So now we're going around the corner towards the back, uh, as, you know, as far as we need to go, as far as we can go, uh, because that patient typically has a lot, a lot of excess skin, and we want to try to prevent, you know, at least reduce the risk um, of having what's called a dog ear to that area. And so we end up extending that incision around the corner towards the back. Thank you. Do you offer thigh tucks? A thigh tuck? Yeah, actually, we just did one today. Uh, so uh, it was called thigh lift. Uh, and so we did a thigh lift today. Um, and they come also in two varieties. It was kind of a minimal uh, excess skin. And sometimes you can do what's called a medial thigh lift. Um, and that gets kind of tucked into the kind of groin crease area. Uh, if it's a lot more excess skin for, like, say, a massive weight loss patient, then we do what's called vertical thigh lift. Uh, and that scar is along the inner thigh, pretty much from the groin to the knee. Okay? Um, now, if you have, say, you know, some fat to the area and just a kind of mild to perhaps moderate excess skin, then my recommendation really would be to do a body type type of procedure, because uh, that way you can avoid the scars in the groin or the medial thigh, uh, and and then and get some skin tightening. It's kind of you know a little bit of the best of both worlds. Is it going to be as aggressive as the lift? No. Uh, but avoiding that scar, I think, it is a big deal. That way, you can wear shorts, you can wear a swimsuit uh, without having exposed scars. Can you do lipo and BBL on someone with fibroids? With fibroids, yeah, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. I mean, unless they're huge fibroids, but uh, for the most part, it's not an issue. I mean, your fibroids are are, in, are basically uh, they form uh, from the the wall, of the uterus. Okay, and the uterus is, is of course deep to the, the muscles, basically deep to your abdominal wall, it's in your abdominal cavity. Uh, and when we do liposuction, uh, we're, not, we're not going deep to that. So liposuction is between the abdominal wall muscles and the skin, right? Uh, so that's the area where you do liposuction. Uh, and so the fibroids and the uterus and the organs are all deep to that. Um, but, and that's also the area where you have visceral fat. That's why I always say, there's no surgical solution to visceral fat. If you have visceral fat, that means that that fat is in that in the abdominal cavities in the area where the organs are, um, and the only way to uh, improve that visceral fat is with diet and exercise. Okay, there's no there's no surgery that we can do to improve visceral fat. Real quick, back to the BBL. At what point after the BBL surgery can you use ab and backboards? Uh, yeah, so actually you can start fairly soon. So um, so. Once you're done with surgery, we're going to put you in your garment. For that first time, you're not going to have any foams or boards or anything because we do expect that you're going to have a lot of drainage. And so basically, you just you would just drain into them. You would ruin all that stuff, okay? Um, so the next day, you know, typically most patients will be able to have their first massage. So after they have their first massage, then they can have their first shower. And while they're doing all that, they can be washing their faja. And when they go back to put their faja on, then you can put in your foams and your, and your boards. Now the foams go first, okay? So you typically put a center, we like to give three foams. So you have a central foam and then two foams to the side, and then you can go ahead and put your, your triangle for the back. Uh, and then if you need some additional or want some additional compression, you can put your ab board on top of the foam, okay? And then your fa. all right? So what goes against the skin will be the foam, and then on top of that, the ab board and then the fa. So you said you did a thigh lift today. Was that in combination with any other procedure and what can you combine it with? No, that was on its own. Um, I mean, can you combine it with other procedures? You can. 
but it is, you know. With a BBL or mommy makeover? No, definitely not with BBL. Uh, and I wouldn't combine it with mommy makeover either. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a big surgery into it, you know, in and of itself. You know, if you want to combine it with another kind of, you know, relatively smaller surgery, maybe an arm lift, um, that would be okay. Uh, but you don't, you don't want to combine it with another lengthy surgery such as body makeover. And then, of course, you know, in terms of life on BBL, you, uh, as we've mentioned many times before, the, um, the rules here are that you only remove, you know, one liter of fat via liposuction if you're doing another procedure that requires a decision such as a thigh lift. So that wouldn't be a good combination either. Wow, that was a quick 30 minutes. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Uh, there is one thing that I did want to mention uh, one more time uh, because I do think it's extremely, extremely important. Okay, and that and this pertains mostly to to leg replacing BBL, but of course it's very, very helpful for any procedure. But I wanted to touch upon one more time uh, the issue of hydration. Okay, hydration is incredibly important. Okay, so you want to just think about this. You've had surgery. Um, and, and you weren't able to eat or drink the night before. And so by the time you get out of surgery, most patients are behind. They're already behind in their hydration, okay? Uh, and so you really, in order to be able to catch up and to start to feel better, you wanna be drinking one to two gallons of fluid a day. And that can be a combination of water, uh, pineapple juice, and then something with electrolytes such as Gatorade, Powerade, or Pedialyte, okay? Uh, you can combine those things, but they all have to add up to at least a gallon a day. And it's extremely important because if you don't do that, you're going to continue to be behind. Your heart rate is going to continue to be elevated. You're going to continue to feel lightheaded, especially when you change positions uh, and also have that feeling of kind of wanting to pass out. So um, that's one of the things that I really kind of want to drive home. Uh, remember, you're starting, you're starting off, you're kind of behind the game already. So you really need to catch up. And so you can't continue to fall behind. You have to be really, really on top of your hydration. You got to get in those one to two gallons a day. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any final questions? Well, let me see. So you have to drink a gallon right after surgery. Does that for every patient? Doesn't matter what size they are. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what size you are, BMI, etc. That's the minimum. That's the minimum. Uh, so you definitely want to be doing that. Um, yeah, starting from day one. No, of course, if you get out of surgery a little bit later in the day, I understand you're not able to drink a gallon, you know, before you have to or you're able to go to sleep at night. But really, I mean, that's that's what you want to do. You want to be, you know, in, in the in the basically a 24-hour period, you want to take in at least a gallon, maybe two. All right. Okay, everybody. So don't fall behind. Stay hydrated so you can recover well, recover faster, and feel better. Okay. Well, I hope this has been uh, very very helpful. Uh, and so. You know, if you have any other questions, of course, you can always write to us. You can let us know if you have, you know, if you want to watch things, uh, you know, where you probably be able to answer any question you may have. Remember to go to the Advocate Plastic Surgery IGTV or go to my YouTube channel. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of information there. Uh, it's going to be very, very helpful for your surgical journey. All right, everybody. So we shall catch you all next week on Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. Take care. Ciao.